For homework assignment number five, you are asked to distill the following arguments, put them in premise conclusion form, and then to diagram them. Beginning on page 98, section A, problem two. Consciousness cannot be explained by the laws of physics and chemistry, so it is not a physical phenomenon. When we number the distinct propositions, we find that there are only two. And this argument is nice because it's already in logical form. So when we put it into premise conclusion form, we don't have to change anything. Some of you may have also noticed that there is a missing premise here, but we didn't worry about identifying this particular set of exercises. The, the assumption, I think, of this argument would be something like uh, all physical phenomenon can be explained by physics and chemistry, or if something can't be explained by physics and chemistry, then it's not a physical phenomenon. But in any event, uh, we weren't looking to identify the implicit premise in this argument. The diagram for this is quite simply one down arrow two. Problem number three. I am sure now that Richard and Lisa are in love. They both have that dreamy look, and besides, I just saw them talking. And here, we number the distinct propositions. Richard and Lisa are in love. They both have that dreamy look. I just saw them talking. And you can see that we delete a lot of information. For instance, we don't need the phrase, I'm sure now. We don't need the words, and besides. And then we can put the argument in premise conclusion form in the following way. And notice here that num what was number one in our initial numbering now becomes number three, since we are arranging the argument according to logical sequence. Now this one is a lot of times confusing, uh, but this argument is diagrammed in the following way. One and two are actually independent premises. And you can see that they're independent, independent premises if you just think about the fact that number uh, what is number one down here in the premise conclusion form, Richard and Lisa have that dreamy look, that by itself does offer independent evidence for three. You don't need two to get that they are in love. Uh, one, I just saw them talking. I mean, that's pretty weak evidence uh, that they are in love. So I think a lot of times students think that one and two are dependent premises. But I, I suppose you could say that even two just by itself, if you saw two people talking, uh, that that might offer additional support to the idea that you think they're in love. And if you go back and you read the argument, I'm sure now that they are in love. So if you said, well, I saw them, they had a dreamy look, and I saw them talking, that would offer further confirmation that they are in love, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know who talks like this anyway, but... Uh, you diagram this one uh, with an arrow down to three and two with an arrow down to three. Independent premises. It is extremely dangerous to carry a can of gasoline in the trunk of your car. Gasoline is highly flammable and it has tremendous explosive power. After all, when it is burned in your engine, a gallon of gasoline is capable of propelling two tons of metal for 20 miles. And here we can identify four distinct propositions. And we put this into premise conclusion form. It's going to look something like this. Uh, you notice here that w the very first proposition we identified is extremely dangerous to carry a can of gasoline in the trunk of your car. That actually becomes our conclusion, and we list it down here as number four. So we have to rearrange the order in order to put it in logical sequence. Notice, furthermore, that... Number what I have listed in the top when we first uh, identified this, um, I have listed as number three. It has extreme explosive power. Um, that it, idea that it has extreme explosive power is actually being supported by this claim that comes after it that it can propel uh, an uh, a gallon can propel what is it two tons of metal for twenty miles or more. So f up here at the top, four is actually being used to support three at the top and it's not four is not being used to support that is highly flammable uh, I mean the fact that it can gas a, ga a gallon of gasoline can propel uh, uh, um, two tons of metal that, that just doesn't speak to its flammability it does ex it speak to its power though so when we look down here in premise conclusion form I've said we want to arrange things in terms of logical consequence and it seems that one leads to two and then two and three, those to, uh, provide reasons uh, to think that it's dangerous to carry uh, 
gasoline to your uh, a gallon in your your car. I mean, the fact that you can think about the fact that three and two are independent premises of one another. Uh, even if one and two, we didn't know those, if we just said, well, gas is highly flammable, well, that would make it dangerous to carry in your car. Likewise, if we didn't know about its flammability, we just were speaking to its explosive power, that would also make it dangerous to carry in your car. So two and three provide independent reasons for thinking that four is true. And one provides evidence for thinking that two is true. Welfare programs are intended to help poor people, but existing welfare programs are not helping. They encourage poor unmarried women to have babies, they discourage poor people from seeking jobs, and they create a habit of dependence. The welfare pro uh, system should be reformed. And we look up here, we notice that uh, we can cross out some of this information because it's really not vital to the argument that is uh, being made here. Uh, it seems like the main conclusion that the person wants to reach is that the welfare system should be reformed. Uh, now, they, they draw another conclusion along the way, which is that programs aren't helping. But let's put this in premise conclusion form. It's going to look something like the following. Existing welfare programs encourage poor unmarried um, women to have babies. Uh, two, existing welfare programs discourage poor people from seeking jobs. Three, existing welfare programs create a habit of dependence. Therefore, existing welfare programs are not helping. Therefore, the welfare system should be reformed. And I think the argument is going to look something like this when we diagram it. Is one, two, and three all constitute separate independent reasons for thinking that welfare programs are not helping. And because they aren't helping, they should be reformed. So... Notice once again, as I've said this before, when we put things into premise conclusion form, we have to rearrange things how oftentimes how they uh, appear when they're first presented. This is a case in point of just that. Okay, so now we come to section B. And in this section, you are asked not only to put the argument into premise conclusion form, but also to identify any implicit premise and then to diagram the argument. And this argument reads as follows. A cat knows how to anticipate. If they didn't, they can never hunt birds or mice or other sportingly fleet prey. And we can put this in premise conclusion form very simply as follows. Now, the next question we have to ask is, what assumption or assumptions is this argument making? And one clear assumption this argument is making is that hunting sportingly fleet prey requires the ability to anticipate. Uh, there's a, another assumption, however, that this argument is making, which is just that cats hunt birds, mice, and other sportingly fleet prey. And the way that we diagram this argument is as follows. I believe that the first assumption, premise one, is actually uh, leading directly to premise two. Uh, premise two is basically just a particular instance of premise one. Premise one is a general uh, claim, is saying, all hunting uh, of sportingly fleet prey requires the ability to anticipate. Well, then the logical consequence of that is that cats would then have to require uh, this ability. And if cats didn't have this ability, then they couldn't do it. Uh, that just logically follows from one. Um, but if that's all we said, we couldn't actually derive the conclusion down here as I've listed at number four. Because what we'd be saying is that if a cat didn't know how to anticipate, they couldn't hunt, hunt birds, mice, or other sportingly fleet prey. And then the conclusion is, is not just a mere hypothetical. Notice that premise two is a mere hypothetical, whereas the conclusion is not a, just a mere hypothetical, an if-then kind of claim. It's a claim of actual fact. Uh, it would be like if I said, uh, if you, you give me $5, then I'll be happy, therefore I'm happy. Well, you have to establish that you actually did give me $5 in order to derive that conclusion. You can't derive a conclusion about actual fact from a mere hypothetical. So we need to then establish uh, that cats do in fact hunt birds, mice, and other sportingly fleet prey in order to establish the conclusion. And this right here, as I indicated a second ago, is how we would uh, diagram this argument. This one was a little complex. Actually, the real answer to this, I think, is even more complex than... Uh, the answer that the book provided. There are two assumptions this argument is making. Truthfully, even if you 
want it, you could have dispensed with one altogether. What is absolutely essential, though I believe the most essential assumption it's making, is actually number three. Um, but sometimes it's good to list other assumptions as well because uh, in this particular case you might think, well, I don't know that hunting sportingly fleet prey does require the ability to anticipate. Um, maybe, I don't know, you could, you could reject that assumption and that could be a, play, a reason to identify this assumption because you might take issue with it. All right. Number three, you see, we don't believe that any of the investment information you can get in financial newsletters, magazines, and newspapers will ever make you rich. That's because mass publications, by definition, are written for the masses. They've got to be somewhat trite and conventional. Now, we can put this in premise conclusion form in the following way. Mass publications are written for mass audiences. Therefore, mass publications must be somewhat trite and conventional. Therefore, investment information you get in financial newsletters, magazines, and newspapers will never make you rich. Now, clearly, there's some gaps in the logic here. And I've tried to identify the assumptions that this argument is making. And there are more we might be able to identify. I'm just going to go ahead and share them with you. But it's going to look something like the following, if it'll ever, if the computer will ever change screens. Let's give it a second. There we go. It's going to look something like the following. Uh, mass publications are written for mass audiences. It's assuming that anything written for a mass audience must be somewhat trite and conventional. Uh, therefore, mass publications must be somewhat trite and conventional. So notice here this first uh, premise, which we are given, is saying mass publications are written for mass audiences. And it's trying to conclude that mass publications have to be trite and conventional. Well, why think that mass publications have to be trite and conventional? Well, because anything written for a mass audience must be, and mass publications are written for mass audiences. So we have that argument going on there, that sub-argument. Mass publications must be somewhat trite and conventional. Then it's assuming that anything that's trite and conventional or trite and conventional information can't make you rich. Another assumption it makes, and I was kind of hesitant to put this in because I was like, is this an assumption or is, I mean, it doesn't ever really say this outright, but it does, you know, seem clearly implied, but newsletters, magazines, and newspapers are mass publications. Um, it doesn't explicitly say that, so I am uh, trying to make that very clear here, but um, newsletters, magazines, and newspapers are mass publications. Therefore, the investment information you get from financial newsletters, magazines, and newspapers will never make you rich. And we can summarize or diagram the argument in the following way. It seems that 1 plus 2a leads down to 3, and then 3, 4, and 5 all lead down to 6. And this is how all the parts of this argument fit together. This is probably the most confusing argument that we had to deal with, so it's just, I'll save my criticism for later, but all languages are the product of the same instrument, namely the human brain. It follows, then, that all languages are essentially the same in their deep structure, regardless of how varied the surface structure might be. And it seems like the basic argument is all languages are the product of the brain therefore all languages are essentially the same in their deep structure but this argument's making a number of assumptions and I would say that you know we could disagree about what those assumptions are but here's one way that you might try to uh, reconstruct this argument all languages are the product of the human brain it's assuming also that language has both a deep and a surface structure uh, I mean, that's something, I mean, you might have read it and been thinking, what in the world is this deep structure and surface structure? I have to answer, I don't know. But it's assuming that language has a deep and surface structure. And then it's also moving on from there to say that the deep structure of language is determined by the brain. And I think three really should be understood as following from one and two. So there's a sub-argument going on right here with one and two leading down to three. That's how I understand it anyway. Then we say the deep structure of language is determined by the brains. Most brains are essentially the same. Or you might have substituted something else here. You might have said that uh, 
you know, something like the following that uh, products that are, I mean, you have to basically assume that, you know, the products of an instrument, if all those instruments are basically the same, that the products will be the same. Something along those lines, but I'm just going to simplify it and say most brains are essentially the same, and therefore all languages are essentially the same in their deep structure. And I think that when we diagram the argument, it's going to look something like the following, that 1 and 2 lead down to 3a, uh, and then 3a and 4a combine to produce the final conclusion, the main conclusion, 5. Like I said, this argument is, is kind of perplexing in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, the assumption is making number 4, most brains are essentially the same, um, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure that, that that's warranted at all. I'm also very um, curious about this claim that you know deep structures would all be the same. Why wouldn't the surface structures also be the same? Uh, it, there, there seems like some unwarranted assumptions going on here, but any, in any event, um, we're not here to criticize. We're just here to understand. And I think this is a representative um, example of how you would diagram this argument right here. Okay, this was taken from, I believe, Sherlock Holmes, but uh, here's what's said. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth? We know that he did not come through the door, the window, or the chimney. We also know that he could not have been concealed in the room, as there is no concealment possible. How then did he come? He came through the hole in the roof. Of course he did. He must have done so. Uh, I'm going to summarize this argument and put it in premise conclusion form in just this way. I had to do it on a different slide just because it's too many words for one slide. But um, premise one, he didn't come through the door, the window, or the chimney. Premise two, he could not have been concealed in the room. Therefore, he came through the hole in the roof. And this argument is making an assumption, and that assumption is there's no other way to enter the room. I mean, how, how do we know he didn't come up through, uh, I don't know, a hole in the floor or something like that? It doesn't, you know. Uh, specify here, but uh, maybe he used a transporter. I don't know. But this is an assumption this argument is making, and here's how we would summarize or diagram the argument in the following way. Now, you may, if you were wanted to, and I have had students do this, is separate premise one into three d different premises. You might have said he did not come through the door, premise one. Premise two, he did not come through the window. Premise three, um, he did not come through the chimney. In which case, when you diagram the argument, it would just be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5a, I think, down to 6 if I got my numbers added correctly there. Uh, so uh, if you did that, that's fine. If, if you just combine them the way I did right here, that's also acceptable. All right, and then we come to the final section, section D. And here, again, you are asked to distill, put in premise con conclusion form, and then diagram. And these arguments were, if you notice, with each uh, successive set of problems, they got more and more complicated. And here, there's more information that you have to uh, rule out. But here's the argument. It says, there's something inherently repugnant about judging people by the color of their skin. Partly it's because it seems wrong to punish or reward people for something over which they have no control. Partially, it's because race is almost never relevant to a person's suitability for anything. Partly, is that the very ethic of individualism demands that we treat people as individuals, not as members of a group. And hopefully, you are able to identify the different propositions here and notice that we can rule out certain uh, words that aren't essential for putting it into premise conclusion form. Uh, however, those words are important for us identifying what is a premise and what isn't. Uh, you know, we see our indicator word here because, so we know that this is uh, a premise. Also, we notice partly, partly, partly. That tips us off that the reasons being offered here are, in, um, they are, they are not dependent, but independent premises. If I say partly this is the reason and partly that's the reason, uh, that's a sign that we're dealing with independent premises. But here's how we would uh, put this argument into premise conclusion form. Once again, we had to reorder uh, and renumber the propositions that we began with because the conclusion was stated first and the uh, initial uh, presentation. And here we want to put it last because we want to arrange things according to logical sequence. And when we go to 
uh, diagram the argument, it's going to look something like this. Now, some of you may have also identified some implicit premises, and there are different things you could say here, but a couple of common things that, that are sometimes come up, and I'm going to point those out uh, in a second. I do want to say that if this is all you did, if you just did one, two, and three like this, down arrows to four, that would be fine for any test or examination we would have. But if you notice that there are some uh, assumptions this argument is making and you identified those as well, uh, that would probably be acceptable also, another way of doing it, just depending on which assumptions you identified and how you diagram them. But here it's two assumptions that we could have identified. Um, and one assumption, which is number two, that people have no control over their race. That's one assumption that's being made. Uh, another assumption is that treating people by their skin color is treating them as members of a group. And if these were the assumptions that we identified, then our diagram is going to look a little more complicated. It's going to look something like this. Notice that once we identified these assumptions here, we had to reorder everything, uh, from, at least from one all the way down. Everything's going to get renumbered. And once we do that, this is going to change how um, our diagram looks in the end. So I just point these out because you know there are different assumptions that you could have noticed here, uh, and there are even different diagrams that are possible. You know I can't go through every possible one, so I'm just trying to give you a couple of different examples to see how this might go. I mean, you kind of have to look at each different um, possibility to see if it's a reasonable interpretation or not. Um, but if you did identify some assumptions with this. Just note that your numbering is going to be a little bit different and also make sure that the assumptions you identified that they do actually constitute part of a legitimate sub-argument. Finally, we should frankly recognize that there is no side of a man's life which is unimportant to society, for whatever he is, does, or thinks may affect his own well-being, which is and ought to be a matter of common concern and may also directly or indirectly uh, affect the thought, action, and character of those with whom he comes in contact. So we put this in a premise conclusion form. Notice that we're going to delete a little bit of information that's not important. But the main conclusion that's being drawn here is that no side of a man's, there is no side of a man's life which is unimportant to society. Um, and this argument's a little confusing, but I think What's going on here is that the arguer is giving us two independent reasons for thinking there's no side of a man's life which is unimportant. One of those reasons is because uh, of the, that man's um, or that individual's own personal well-being. The other reason is because of how that individual affects others' well-being. So those are the two independent reasons, but... Uh, within those two independent, there's also a sub-argument that's, or there's a couple of those premises, I should say, that combine together. Um, and that would be one and two. Uh, one and two function as dependent uh, reasons to lead to four, and three functions independently of one and two to lead to four. And if you go back and you look at the uh, initial presentation of the argument, it says, Whatever he is, does, or thinks may affect his own well-being, which is and ought to be a, con a matter of common concern. You see that two and three are being, uh, I'm sorry, my numbering is getting confused here, but two and three at the top, these are, are different propositions that are being joined together uh, in order to lead to the conclusion uh, down here, number four down here. Um, and then it says, and... You know, and the and here offers a separate line of, of reason to think that there's no side of a man's life which is unimportant to society. And that separate reason is that his actions might impact um, directly or indirectly uh, others whom he comes in contact with. So I know that some of this, uh, I seem a little um, ambivalent. I'm like, well, it could be this, it could be that. And that's because... It is, it is unclear, uh, and I don't want to say it's unclear, but it is somewhat open to interpretation. I mean, there's certainly some wrong things you could say here, um, but there's also a range of acceptable right answers. The ones I've provided, I think, are good examples of um, possible right answers. There could be other ones. Like, you may have in this one identified uh, a different 
you know, maybe you identified a few assumptions or maybe in a couple of the previous ones you identified different assumptions there as well. Uh, but be that as it may, if you're getting close, if you're in the ballpark and doing this, then you should be on the right track. If you have any concerns or questions about maybe answers you came up with, please email me or maybe even post those to uh, the questions of, uh, about content on Blackboard so others can see it as well because if you have a question, chances are somebody does also.